My fellow Americans, Memorial Day is a day of ceremonies and speeches. Throughout America today, we honor the dead of our wars. We recall their valor and their sacrifices. We remember they gave their lives so that others might live. The unknown soldier who has returned to us today and whom we lay to rest is symbolic of all our missing sons. About him, we may well wonder as others have. Did he marry? Did he have children? Did he look expectantly to return to a bride? We'll never know the answers to these questions about his life. We do know, though, why he died. He saw the horrors of war and bravely faced them. Certain his own cause and his country's cause was a noble one. That he was fighting for human dignity, for free men everywhere. Let us, if we must, debate the lessons learned at some other time. Today, we simply say with pride, Thank you, dear son. May God cradle you in his loving arms. We must never forget, we must always remember that the, the blessings that we enjoyed daily in America come at the expense of many, many, those who gave their lives and offered their blood as a sacrifice, brave men and brave women throughout the, the years of our American history. The well-worn statement, freedom is never free, is absolutely true. In fact, our liberty comes at a tremendous cost. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning would be the liberty's price or the price of liberty, seeing that it is never free, the great sacrifice of so many. In fact, there's three points we'll make today uh, on the, uh, the message. It's not a lengthy message, but I think it's one that we need to hear today, especially as we gather in honor tomorrow of celebration of Memorial Day. We'll talk about the great price of liberty, the results of liberty, and then the ultimate liberty that we can all enjoy. The price of liberty, I think if you're familiar at all with American history, sometimes I think that's not being taught as it used to be taught in schools. It was on June 11th of 1776. Thomas Jefferson, James Madison began to draft a document that later be known as the Declaration of Independence. About a month later on July 4th of that same year, 56 men gathered in what was known as the Continental Congress to accept and approve this particular document. Finally, on August 2nd, the declaration was ready for signing. 56 men gathered in that room. The question remained at this point, who would sign this declaration? Who would be willing to put their signature on this piece of paper that would be sent to England, whose names would be on theirs, almost as a, a death warrant? Every man in that room knew the potential of signing this document and what the cost would be at this point. They knew they could lose their home, they could lose their properties, they could be hanged by the British as treasonous rebels, their wives and their children could be thrown into prison, ultimately putting everything they had and possessed and owned on the line by signing this piece of paper. But yet when it came to be presented before the Continental Congress, Richard Henry Lee stood and presented the document John Hancock was the first to come, signed the document. Every man in that room stepped up to the table, followed him, and signed the Declaration of Independence. Someone wrote of these men. These were not wild-eyed, rabble-raising ruffians. They were dedicated, consecrated, educated, determined me men of means and education. In fact, 24 of these men were lawyers. 11 of them were merchants. Nine were owners of very large lands. And when they signed the document and agreed to, they knew that putting their name on such a public piece of paper would certainly mean prison, if not being tortured, or ultimately, as we said, death. 
Nine of the 56 were captured, and those nine ended up being tortured and eventually putting, put to death. Two of those men signed that document, lost their sons in the war that followed. Another two had their sons captured and tortured. Twelve of the 56 men had their homes destroyed, ransacked, and burned to the ground. Typical of those 56 was a man by the name of John Hart, whose farm and mill was completely destroyed. In fact, he had to live for a couple of years in hiding in caves and forest and trying to make a, a life for himself. When he finally returned home after not seeing his family for those two years, he discovered that his wife had died. His children had vanished. In fact, it was a few weeks later they said that it was written of him that John died of a broken heart. These men are men who valued liberty. These people are men who valued life. But they stood tall and unwavering and committed. They pledged their life to support this document called the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence begins with that famous line we should all know very well. All men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. But remember the last line as well when it says, We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. They knew well the cost. We're a nation that has been not only born, but sustained by the, the blood of sacrifice. Our liberties are written out in blood, the blood of our sons and our daughters. I don't know if you've been to Valley Forge or not. There's a large park there. That's that You've probably seen pictures of that statue, the great bronze statue of George Washington kneeling there in the park. But he, stands, he kneels there, and that park has been established to commemorate that season of war in which the Continental Army suffered such great loss. They were surrounded by the British on every side. It was a difficult and hard winter. Bloody footprints were left in the snow by bootless men. Near naked soldiers were wrapped in blankets, huddled around fires of green wood just to kind of stay alive. It was written more than 2,000 soldiers from that Continental Army died that winter in hiding. This army of skeletons, it was called by Governor Lewis Moore, he said, the army of skeletons appeared before our eyes naked, starved, sick, and discouraged. The Frenchman Marquis de Lafayette wrote this, the unfortunate soldiers were in want of everything. These soldiers had neither coats nor hats, many without shirts and shoes. Their feet and their ankles and their legs were frozen till they turned black, making it often necessary for them to be amputated. 2,000 people, 2,000 soldiers died that winter from disease alone. But Washington troops survived that terrible winter and eventually Praise God, won the war in America's liberty. But many wars, not just the American War, the Revolutionary War, have been stamped with blood of our patriots. From the Revolutionary War, to the War of 1812, to the Mexican-American War, to the war between the states, to the Spanish-American War, to World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, in each, the price of liberty has always been blood, sacrifice. The freedom of thought, the freedom of speech that we enjoy, the freedom of religion, of commerce, and of industry, the right to vote, the right to bear arms, the right to meet here and worship, the right to self-determination of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, all purchased with this great price of blood. It was General Sherman who made the great comment, war is hell. He knew what he was saying. But unfortunately, those of us who understand spiritual principles realize that as long as there's sin, there will be war. As long as there's sin, there's greed, there's envy. There's men who would seek to rule over other men and enslave people and enslave men and enslave children. And liberty is usually and only often won by war. The price of liberty is blood, it's sacrifice. Greater love hath no man than he lay down his life for his friends. But the result of liberty, today 
America as a land, even throughout our history, has been undeniably blessed by God. We've enjoyed the favor. We've enjoyed the blessings of God's great grace upon our lives. Many enemies have come against us. But God has been with us over and over and over again and allowed our nation's preservation. And we've preached on it often and said it, but I won't spend much time there to say we are a nation that desperately needs a revival. We're a nation that needs a fresh, renewing breeze of God's presence and His Spirit to blow across this nation. We're a nation where churches need to come back to God. Then a nation might follow. We need to see God do something glorious in our midst. But I believe God has blessed America because the liberty that she has enjoyed, she has used wisely in past centuries to share the gospel, to send missionaries around the world, to open hospitals all over the world, to reach people with the gospel around the world. America's sons and daughters across the globe have gone to fight for liberty of other nations and other countries. So God has blessed us. America has been the world's last bastion for freedom. It was Richard Wombard, who was a Romanian evangelical Christian, founder of the Voice of the Martyrs, in 1967 made this statement, every freedom-loving man has two fatherlands, his own and America. Today, America is the hope of every enslaved man because it is the last bastion of freedom in our world. This was a man who knew what it was like to hide for fear. This was a man who spent years in prison by the communists for his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. America must remain free. But for America to remain free, we have to be a people who return to our sovereign God with hearts that are open and repentant before him. We love we embrace our freedoms in America, but we must always remember that the roots of our freedom are found in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it's so difficult. We, we see so many people who've given their lives and shed so much blood. It's difficult why some people refuse to, to understand the liberty that's been purchased. But even more difficult for me as a minister of the gospel is for people who don't understand the liberty that's been purchased and offered to them by the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's the third point the ultimate liberty. It's one thing to, be, to, to come to a place where the, the chains of bondage, of tyranny, of dictatorship, of communism are broken. But it's another thing on a completely different scale to understand when the chains of sin are broken and life comes and liberty comes. But the price for that liberty also was blood. But just not any ordinary man's blood. This was the blood of the very Son of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That is the ultimate sacrifice for all of us. That he suffered, he died, he paid a price for sin that was not his to pay, but was ours to pay, but yet he shed his blood. That we might win another war and that we might experience a greater freedom and that is freedom in Christ. The Bible tells us without the shedding of blood there's no remission, there's no removal of our sins. The only way that we can have peace with God is for sin to be paid for. And praise God that Jesus Christ came and gave himself as the ultimate sacrifice for every man's sin. It was moving this morning to watch the different men come upon and women come upon the stage who served our country. Everywhere I go, I'm always cognizant of the fact to tell soldiers and veterans that I appreciate their service because I do. I understand what it bought and what it purchases for us. I don't think anybody in this room would walk up to any one of those people that was here on the stage and say, you know, I really, I really can't appreciate what you did for me. You know, in fact, I reject the liberty for which, you know, all your friends and brothers and sisters died so that I could possess it. I reject that. But you know, people do that with Christ. He who knew no sin... He who gave up his life, the one who bore our sins, the one who gave everything that we might be free. People still stand and say, I, I reject the freedom which you purchased. I don't need your liberty. I don't need your sacrifice. I don't need your blood. And the scripture makes it clear, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Well, the answer is obvious to that one, by the way. You can't. You won't. There's no hope. We understand that liberty 
that has to be experienced for us to experience God and to experience eternity with God has to come through the sacrifice that he made on our behalf, which was done at the cross for our sins. So we come, we recognize that, and we honor him because he's given everything for us. In fact, the big question today was not that are you enjoying the liberty that was pur purchased by so many that we will memorialize and remember tomorrow. We talk about Memorial Day. But do we understand or do we remember or do we experience today the liberty which Jesus Christ has paid for us? Or are we ignoring what he's done? Are we choosing to live in our bondage? Are we choosing to live in our selfishness? Are we choosing to continue to go our own way when such grace has been demonstrated at the cross on our behalf? No greater love has any man, then he lay down his life for his friends. Amen. Folks, that's the word of God. So the question comes at this point and begs literally, have you received that liberty? We experience today the liberty of, the, of, of soldiers, the price of freedom, but do we experience the liberty that comes through Jesus Christ? Memorial Day is an important day, I believe, for our nation. We have several unique holidays around our nation. Armed Service Day, Veterans Day, Memorial Day. And these are so important because we need to be called to remembrance. We need to come back and, and take a moment to slow down and to pause and to remember what's been done for us. But even more so, we need to also slow down and remember what Christ has done for us and is it affecting our life today? Are we letting God do something with our lives? Praise God for those 56 men who stood in that room and realized it cost them their lives to share that message of freedom. Praise God for every missionary and every pastor and every Christian who's ever shared the gospel so that somebody else might be free as well. This is an extremely short message for me, I know. But I don't want to miss the importance of Memorial Day for us as a people. So I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed and no music this morning. As we close this service today, I want us just in silence.